So uh, you won't be surprised by this if you don't already know this, but I'm a fidgety person. <laughs> right? Like that's really, that's not news to anybody. Um, whether it's how many, I, I, someone once asked how far do I think I've run in place with my knee bobbing up and down during a single one hour worship service. Um, and I am a, I love clicky pens. Like, like clicking, like the action of clicking the pen. In fact, at my former office, they took clicky pens away from me. Um, uh, one of the many things I loved about Duncan was he bought me all the clicky pens I could ever want. Um, and it speaks to something of authenticity. I, I bring up the clicky pen because I'm actually an accidental product tester because I'm really good at figuring out which ones were made to last and which ones like pop apart you know, 258 clicks in. Um, and, and when you do that, you get a little spring, right? Some kind of spring mechanism, a small, tightly wound spring that's allowing the pen to pop out when you let the spring pop it out and is being held back in tension when not. Uh, much like if you think about a trampoline, the springs along the edges of the trampoline have these tightly wound coils. I want you to think about that, whether you've got a trampoline coil or an old bed coil or just a little clicky pen coil. Think about if you're holding that spring and you point it at yourself where you're looking down the hole of the spring. And what shape do you see? A circle. You see a perfect circle where if you picked your finger at any point of it and went around, it would end at the beginning. Right? What happens when you tilt that spring and now you look at it longwise? It's not a circle anymore, is it? You find out, in fact, that if you were able to run your finger, you would actually slide down and down and down as you make not perfect circles, but a three-dimensional circle-like shape, where every time you appear to have come back to the beginning, you are, in fact, at a slightly different space. I name that because for me, that's what happens the first time you read from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. You can believe you've come full circle. That here we are back in God's new Eden. That God has eradicated the failed project of the first Eden. And we've come back now as new earth is an Eden once again. And for many people in the last 200 years really who have read the varying apocalyptic literature of our scripture tend to want to think that this is the vision that John is having or that Daniel has or in the little apocalypses of Zephaniah and of Luke and of Isaiah that they are having that God gets to this point scraps the whole thing and makes it perfect again that's not really what's happening, is it? If you look at the vision of Revelation 21, it is not Eden. It's Eden-esque. It's very similar, but it's what I like to call an urban garden. Very different in many ways than the garden we get in Genesis 1 but a garden nonetheless with this very organic vision of God and humanity, of creation and trees of life and rivers running through the cities. It's both Jerusalem and Eden brought together at the bottom of this coiled 
spring when we come to an ending that is neither the beginning nor entirely different than the beginning. And for the apocalyptic visionary, what I believe we've misunderstand over and over again is that somehow when we finally realize that we've used up or truly broken God's toy, creation, that God will scrap that project and build us a new one. And that's not what Revelation says at all. But in fact, this vision that God had at Eden has drawn down into our world where it says the home of God is among mortals. It is not a scrapping of what was, but a radical reinvestment of what could be. In our Reformed theology terms, we talk about the already not yetness of God's kingdom. It is already here. God is with us. We have had the, what it means to be human revealed to us in the birth of Christ. And yet, we're not really there yet. We can see all that is yet wrong and broken and hurting in our world. And to our discredit, Christianity far too long has used an ethic of escape to imagine that it's okay that we ruined God's creation because God's just going to build us a new one and then take us out of this failed project and plop us in it. But that's not what God says to us. See, I am doing a new thing. In the wilderness, streams will run and be made glad. In Jerusalem, a garden will break out and start to grow. Wilderness will be reborn. And a child shall lead you. Have you, raise your hands, have you ever seen the movie WALL-E? Right? Uh, it, it's that movie, I don't know how it made it out of a planning room. I mean, who pitched a sketch for a movie in which there will be almost no dialogue for children about rusted out, broken down robot? Who never utters a word? Other than squeaky sounds. Oh, but wait, it's all saved by his non-talking cockroach friend. How that made it out of a planning session, I don't know. But it's a phenomenal movie. And Warren wore out his first copy of it. We had to get another copy. I remember sitting there going like, why does he like this? Why does this work? The basic premise of the first part of the movie is everything we've done with apocalyptic literature, right? Humanity burned up, used up, garbaged up creation. And so they loaded themselves into spaceships and they launched themselves out into space where they could survive because there was nothing survivable on earth anymore. And through the course of the movie, it changes to a vision not altogether unlike what I believe John saw in Revelation. That God will take the garbage dump we've turned earth into and plants will grow in it again. And trees will grow in it again. And the roots of those plants and trees will break down the hard edges of our world, will compost the garbage of our mistakes, and we can reinvest, not in fleeing from, avoiding, or not looking at the world we've left behind us, 
but reinvest in it until it is a wilderness reborn. It turns out Wally is a better theologian than most of us. Along the way in Advent, uh, a strange thing begins to happen if you take note of it. In songs, in liturgies, in the readings, and how we choose to read them and interpret them, you will imagine that Jesus came to save who? Who do you think we imagine Jesus was born to save? Maybe you say us, maybe you say me, maybe you're being honest that way. Or I heard someone say the world. God isn't in this to save you or me. God is in this to save creation. All of it. Not just the human beings. But if you start to look, you'll realize how often we imagine that God's only interested in saving the human ones. The ones that are made in God's image. As if God didn't make us using earth and sky and air. As if all of it isn't a part of the very heartbeat of God's dream for creation. I love this final verse of the hymn that we've been guided by because it talks about wilderness being reborn. It talks about the garden that is Eden prospering again. It talks about the fact that Advent isn't just Jesus coming to save you and I, but it's coming to save the world, the earth, the sky, the seas, and all that is in it. God has a system approach to healing the fractured way we live our lives. And God is coaxing us to dream this dream with God, in which the alreadyness of the kingdom, God's radical investment and presence in your life, in my life, in our life, and in the life of the world, is dragged together with the not yetness, the hurt and the harm we cause one another, the consumption of the resources of the world at an unsustainable rate, the hardness of heart in which we create systems that dehumanize all of us. And God will take these two realities, this Jerusalem and this Garden of Eden, and God will pull them together until they are not recognizable apart. And that's the advent we're looking for. Nothing less than that big a system approach to where all things are made new. C.S. Lewis talks about it, writes about it, saying everything will be what it was. It'll just be more what it was than before. More alive, more bright, more true. We'll come back, not to the beginning, but to where we were in the beginning with the kind of understanding and perspective we've gained because we walked around the spiral again and again if we need to. Heraclitus, I know you were waiting for some Greek philosophy here, says you cannot step in the same river twice. Right? You can't step in the same river twice because it's not the same, nor are you. We come full circle back to Eden. But it's not an Eden like we left. And we aren't the people who left Eden. We are all a part of God's great system-wide project to create a world that seeks no harm, that lives together, that is invested in wilderness reborn. When I moved to Atlanta, I was a fairly, uh, no, let's not even say fairly. I was a, a sheltered northern kid. 
I mean, I'd gone to school in Virginia whereby I learned the Civil War wasn't over. Um, but I went to school largely in Northern Virginia. And then I went to Atlanta and started to learn the true depth of race relations and class relations and the challenges I had largely been seps had been uh, protected from in my little suburban upbringing. Uh, in Atlanta, there's a church. Uh, one of our members used to uh, uh, be on the session there, uh, Central Presbyterian Church. If you went there today, it has a motto, and the motto is, the church that stayed. And the reason that's their motto was because in, there was a period in time in which Atlanta was experiencing ra radical growth and radical racial tensions. And many, most, of the white mainline churches left Atlanta and moved to the suburbs as part of what we would call white flight. And Central said, we're the church that stayed. And they made that hard decision to be a church that had to change the makeup of themselves and their engagement with their community. Not to stay like a church with fortress walls that pretended not to see the neighborhood in which it lived in, but to truly allow themselves to be changed by the changes to their community. They went through their own Wally journey when everyone else wanted to jump on a ship and get out of town. But someone had to stay and keep tending the soil that wasn't in fact dying but lying dormant until we could reinvest and continue to reinvest and see it reborn. God is coming. A couple weeks we'll light that middle candle not to save us from the world but to show us how to invest in the world, to be God with us, that we might become us with us. Investing in empowering one another, walking alongside one another, and seeing to it that the world we inhabit is not used up, but lived in, in a deeply organic and sustainable and life-giving way. And this is wilderness reborn, hope dawning in a weary world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.